welcome everyone to OSHER at Dartmouth's fourth special event. My name is Pam Allen and I am OSHER's special events coordinator. This morning, we're proud to present Linda Fowler, Pre Professor of Government and Frank J. Reagan Chair in Policy Studies Emerita at Dartmouth College. Linda will speak on the dysfunctional Congress, how it got so bad and why it matters. OSHA member Martha Clark will introduce Linda and facilitate the conversation. Martha has been an OSHA member since 2005 and has been taking courses continuously ever since. She was on the leadership council for six years, served as secretary, and is currently on the summer lecture series committee. Martha will field your questions placed in the Q&A. Please enjoy the program. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Pam said, we are happy to receive your questions through the Q&A. We will not be monitoring the chat. And to submit your question, tap the Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar. Type your question into the box that then appears and click send. We'll do our best to respond to as many questions as time allows. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Linda Fowler is Professor of Government and Frank J. Reagan Chair in Policy Studies Emerita at Dartmouth College, where she continues to teach and conduct research. She directed Dartmouth's Nelson A. Rockefeller Center for Social Scientists from 1995 to 2004. She specializes in American politics publishing numerous articles and chapters, two books on congressional elections, and a recent study of national oversight in the Senate. Her research on veto-proof majorities in Congress appeared in Political Research Quarterly in 2018, and an article on the continued decline of congressional oversight during the Obama and Trump administrations appeared in 2021. Linda Fowler received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2005 and 6, and several awards for her research, as well as awards for undergraduate teaching at Syracuse and Dartmouth. She is a frequent commentary, uh, commentator on American politics in various media outlets. I give you Linda Fowler. Good morning. It's the Ides of March. I thought maybe um, this turned out would be an unlucky day for me, but let's hope it's an unlucky day for uh, other uh, dictator, wannabe dictators uh, like Vladimir Putin. Um, I want to talk to you today about reflections I've been developing over the last um, year and a half since the invasion of the Capitol on January 6th. That was a traumatic event for me, not just as a citizen, but as a political scientist. Um, what I saw that day made me wonder whether the institution in which I'd worked in 1969 and 70, the institution I studied for over 50 years and have written extensively about during that time, whether I really understood anything about it at all. Um, what puzzled me and disturbed me the most was not that the, the attempt to invade the Capitol succeeded, um, that's actually happened before, uh, but that members of the Congress after fleeing for their lives came back into session and over 140 of them actually voted in ways that were <clears throat> uh, consistent with the demands of the rioters. So I decided that I needed to go back to my own experience in Congress when an invasion of the Capitol almost happened, but didn't and see what lessons I could draw from that. So let me take you back to 1969 when I was fresh out of college and um, worked, had just gotten a job on Capitol Hill. I'd been there maybe eight months. And um, it was, excuse me, it, um, after that, the spring of 1970 was when Richard Nixon ordered the secret bombings of Cambodia at the height of the Vietnam War. Um, and I worked late as most Capitol staffers did um, and I was getting ready to leave the office on Friday evening uh, to go get my car and pick up my husband at Marine Corps headquarters. Uh, and um, we had been hearing rumors 
for the last couple of days on the Hill about the fact that a, a terrorist group called the Weathermen um, or the Weather Underground, that they were planning an attack uh, on Washington that weekend and, um, and that they were going to be abetted in that attack by a massive demonstration that was scheduled to um, protest the secret bombing of the war on, uh, of, of Cambodia, a neutral country. So there was much um, debate about it and a lot of anxiety. And I went to get my car um, that Friday night and um, the demonstration was planned for the next day and I and my husband planned to go. Uh, and um, as I went down to the Rayburn garage, which is a cavernous uh, parking area under the uh, major Capitol Hill office building, um, I was going to my car and I could barely get to it because the whole underground garage was full of Jeeps with paratroopers, with walkie talkies and, um, and lots of engine noise and whatever. And I subsequently learned that there were troops stationed all over the city to quell what everybody expected would be exceptional violence. Um, and I got in my car and I could hardly believe what I was seeing, that the people's house was full of military people and that all of the demonstrations that had been happening outside of the Capitol, um, the petitions, the uh, delegations of concerned citizens and so forth was leading to what looked very, very dangerous to me. The next day um, was a beautiful spring day. It turned out the weathermen never showed up. It turned out that the massive demonstration that brought in hundreds of thousands of ordinary citizens um, to protest uh, what Nixon had done in the war was completely peaceful. And um, the invasion that was expected and the potential for um, military engagement um, against the civilian population didn't materialize. So I've thought a lot about that event and sort of why the Congress um, became a place that needed to be defended by paratroopers from Fort Bragg. Um, and remembering it with my youthful eyes, it was a time when a small band of Southern conservative Democrats were controlling uh, the Congress and um, they were preventing any sort of votes on the Vietnam War. So the legitimate expression of dissent was being blocked by a small handful of powerful people. These chairs were very old. Um, more than half of them were in their 80s. The Speaker of the House at the time, a man named John McCormick from Massachusetts, was so infirm that there were oxygen tanks kept in the House cloakroom in case he keeled over at the podium. And the few times that I went to the floor, I would see him presiding very weakly, barely able to hold his gavel and certainly not able to control the attention of the members. Um, compare him to Nancy Pelosi, also somebody of advanced years, but certainly hale and hearty and able to control her members. But the main point was that Congress, despite the efforts of activists, um, refused to take a vote on the Vietnam War. They kept funding it, but they, um, but they weren't really willing um, to, um, to let pe put people on record as actually supporting or opposing the war. Um, that finally came in 1975 when Congress cut off funding for the war. And that led, of course, to the disastrous evacuation of Saigon with the horrible images of the helicopters taking off the roofs. But the point of this story um, is that Congress is often um, the place where government failure happens. And when that happens, it has enormous ripple effects it affects the way all of the branches uh, face. And more importantly, it means that legitimate vehicles for defense, dissent, um, debate and voting on the floor of the People's House and the Senate 
has become, uh, is an avenue that's shut off. In the 1960s, late 1960s and early 70s, the threat to the legitimacy of the government came from the left. In January, November, December, and January of 2020, the threat to the legitimacy of the government came from the right. Um, so no party has a monopoly on um, challenging the legitimacy of this government. But what was different, I think, fundamentally different, was that the gatekeepers in the 1960s and 70s kept the radical fringe out of legitimate positions of power. They were not allowed to run for Congress. They were not elected because the party still controlled the nominations um, and the party still controlled money for Congress. They were not, um, so in the 1960s, there were no insiders in the government who are, were espousing left-wing um, arguments about the need for violence to overthrow the government. Fast forward to, 19, to 2020, and what you see is, and we know more about this now than we did on January 6, is that there were many people in the White House and many people in Congress and many people um, in, with responsibilities in the national parties who basically were not, were listening to the, the violent radical fringe and were either intimidated by them enough that they went along with it or they were actively encouraging it. And so my question that I wanna address today is why 50 plus years later did the institutions not hold why were the radical elements not prevented from getting so close to the levers of power as they had been in the 1960s? So let me talk first of all and sort of suggest to you that Congress is the problem and Congress also has to be the solution if we're going to address the kind of political instability and divisiveness that we have right now. Now, Congress has always been the butt of jokes and criticism. Uh, here's a recent cartoon. So Congress is in recession or in session and the caption for this cartoon is basically, why bother? They both mean the same thing. But this is only just a recent manifestation. We've made Congress a butt of national political humor for most of our series. Certainly Mark Twain, with his famous book, The Gilded Age, uh, poked fun at Senator Balloon, who was a very corrupt figure, um, symbolizing the corruption of the Gilded Age. Um, humorist Will Rogers used to say um, that the only native uh, criminal class we have in the United States is members of Congress. So maybe that was Mark Twain too. Um, but there are always famous, um, uh, comedians making fun of members of Congress, just as Saturday Night Live does today. Um, what's different is that, uh, and even when Congress does well, the public opinions never give, uh, public opinion polls never show uh, that Congress gets very much credit for when it does work well. There are a couple of good reasons that are historical and constitutional for the fact that Congress is so often disrespected by its constituents. The institution is more open um, from, uh, to the press and the public. Uh, people who run for Congress often run for it by running against it. Um, so even his own members don't defend it very effectively. Um, the job of Congress is to resolve conflict. What Madison wrote about Congress in um, the Federalist Papers was that its job was to refine and enlarge the public view. That is to say, to overcome the, the divisive forces and try to forge um, a consensus that would govern the whole nation through debate and through gradual understanding of alternative points of view when members went to the Capitol. This is a tough job in politics and it's one reason why some humorists say it's really the only sport for grown-ups because um, it's tough work, it's demanding work, it often is very time-consuming work. 
So the invasion of the capital um, was something different. And as I say, dissidents have tried to take over the capital in the past. This time they succeeded. Um, and so um, I think there are some similarities just as um, cultural issues are very divisive now. So the Vietnam War, which also became a cultural issue, uh, was very divisive at the time. We had in the 1960s, late 1960s and in the 70s, we had presidents in office who took a very expansive view of executive power. If you recall famously, Richard Nixon said, if the president does it, it's constitutional. And we've had similar a view of the presidency echoed by um, Donald Trump when he was in office. But there are differences and that's what I wanna talk about today uh, that seem to keep things um, if extremely worrisome back in the late 60s and 70s. That was an awful time in American politics. But one thing happened then that after all of the demonstrations and whatever. We had an election in 1974 where the voters cleaned house and punished a lot of Republicans for their support of Richard Nixon and um, the pro prolongation of the war. In addition, those new members, a lot of them, 60 plus, um, became the backbone of major reforms of the institution. So what's really different now is that elections in, 19, in 2022 are not going to send a raft of reform-minded freshmen to Washington. And more importantly, the ones who are already there are not going to be interested in major institutional reform. And so my talk really is how Congress ended up being so disinterested in making its own institution work. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the most important is erosion of norms and civility, reciprocity, which often is talked about as you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But what it basically meant is there was a lot of horse trading um, among members uh, back in the day, and that helped to create mutual obligation. There were norms of restraint. There were certain things you didn't say on the floor of the Congress. There were certain things you didn't say during the State of the Union address. There were exaggerated sometimes means of uh, forcing members to be respectful to each other. The most important probably was there was respect for policy expertise. Some of the most important members of Congress were people who were not in the headlines. They did the tough work of drafting legislation, of shepherding it through Congress. And even though presidents often got the credit for that, Ronald Reagan's famous reform of social security in 1983 is a classic example of that. All the heavy lifting is done, has been done in the past in Congress. Today, in addition, what we see from that is that almost all of those things that sort of grease the wheels of Congress are um, really present in the failure of lawmaking in co contemporary Congresses. And you have to understand this predates Trump uh, and it happened under both parties. The volume of legislation has shrunk, even though I don't think most people think the problems facing the country have gone away. The timeliness of bills is no longer, uh, seems to be an issue. We have lots of unaddressed problems uh, notably climate change, but also income inequality, uh, decay of rural areas, um, the loss of um, uh, competence in many of our schools. Um, these are unaddressed problems um, that command large majorities on public opinion polls where Republicans and Democrats can agree. And yet, if you looked at the Congress, you would see nothing resembling agreement. Um, you need super majorities to pass anything because the norm of the filibuster has deteriorated where it is used routinely now. You have giant omnibus bills that are so complicated that people can't understand them. That was the big problem with the Build Back Better bill that uh, the uh, 
Biden administration tried. Nobody knew what was in it, and therefore it was impossible to mobilize public opinion to support it, even though each individual item uh, had a very strong constituency in the nation. Um, and you have a cramming of unrelated bills into large packages to get something done. You have uh, Congress really neglecting its power of the purse. There are missed deadlines for budgets. We're finally now getting passage of the fiscal year 2022 budget being considered now in March of 2022, when it should have passed in September 30 of 2021. And that's routine. So the government is basically operating right now after more than a year of the Biden administration under what essentially is a Trump budget. And anything that doesn't fit in that budget gets uh, passed as um, an emergency appropriation where it adds to the deficit, even though it doesn't show up in the budget. So you have missed deadlines. You're operating government under continuing resolutions. You have the shutdown of government and the threat of shutdown. You have lawmakers threatening um, uh, on default, even though um, raising the, the uh, deficit ceiling is something that pays for past expenditures that the government has already uh, committed to. You have a dysfunctional tax code and weak enforcement so that fraud, particularly among white collar people is uh, rampant um, and, uh, and I could go on. You have relations with the executive branch uh, at uh, very um, strained situations, particularly under divided government. There are confirmation delays for, uh, for presidential appointments to the cabinet and to other major offices. You have, have had delays with nominations for the federal courts. You have tight votes on approval of these uh, uh, judicial appointments, where it used to be the norm that presidents had deference for their picks and where it was only sort of an egregiously exercise of bad judgment on the part of the White House that they would be blocked by Congress. Um, you also have um, abuse of the rules. The filibuster, as you know, is um, something that stops um, debate in Congress because one member threatens to take over the floor and speak and disrupt a legislative business. business. To overcome a filibuster, you need the votes of 60 senators. And what that means is that you need a supermajority in the Senate for um, passage of any bill because we have a bicameral legislature. What's happened in the Senate, there are several reasons. One is that the Senate is now dominated by small, predominantly rural states that um, can block legislation that is of greater interest to the majority population. In the past, if you look at this graph, if you go down to 1960 over to the left-hand side, you'll see that we've always had the filibuster. In the 60s and 50s and 60s, it was used to block civil rights legislation. It's gone up increasingly. And then if you look at uh, 2020, you see that we had 298 votes to shut off debate and allow the Senate to do its business. Um, you had other very high times um, back in 2016, it looks like 2017, um, 2017. So what this means is that a small determined minority uh, is controlling um, what the Congress does. And this has gotten worse and worse and worse as the unrepresentative nature and its tilt towards small rural states has increased with population control. Uh, and, um, and the filibuster is just one of the abuses of the rules. Legislative holes where one member threatens um, to gum up the, the works have been used to block appointments. At one point, Senator Ted Cruz had holds on around 50 appointees because um, he didn't like something the State Department was doing. Josh Hawley, another Republican, has done the same thing. These are not well known, people don't understand. What they see is the consequence that Congress can't act and that it's not doing its job.
you see um, reconciliation bills for policymaking. Reconciliation bills are budget bills, basically, that are not subject to the, the uh, filibuster. So now everything gets packed into a reconciliation bill, uh, and its, con it's uh, con connection to the budget can often be quite tenuous. So the major Biden legislation that has passed the Congress has, off, has been done through reconciliation where it's not subject to a, a filibuster. But that means that issues like um, criminal justice reform or other kinds of major policy issues um, can be blocked by the filibuster because they're not directly tied to the budget. And again, you end up with these very complicated bills that the public doesn't understand. Um, you have exclusion of the minority party from decision making. In the past, the majority and minority leaders used to work closely together in the Senate. They were often friends, even though they were partisan rivals. That is simply less and less uh, the case. In the House, where the rules are stricter, the party leaders are much more uh, disinclined to listen to the minority now and they can ram things through because there is no filibuster in the House with uh, just a, a narrow partisan majority, and they do. And even in committees now where the minority used to have a lot of say in getting provisions into bills uh, to further their passage out of committee, that process has broken down too. Uh, so when the minority party has no say and has no option of affecting legislative outcomes, what do you think you're going to get? Obstruction, grandstanding, and irresponsible behavior. And we see that in spades right now in today's Congress. You have failure of oversight and especially foreign policy. That's what my last book was about. And basically Congress, because it's undermined its committee system and put so much power in the hands of party leaders, the committees which used to be the workhorses of Congress where the source of expertise, the source of compromise and negotiation on bills. Members don't meet in committee as much as they used to. They don't do very much business in committee. And because of polarization, they often are um, not engaged in constructive oversight of the executive. Instead, you get witch hunts in some of in, in committees or what the other party perceives as being witch hunts rather than constructive questioning of the executive branch. The whole process of hearings has broken down badly since the Clinton administration and members of Congress are just not having public hearings the way they used to. Um, this is true, particularly of wartime when uh, during the Korean Wars, the Vietnam War, even the Gulf War, there were many, many hearings, both in executive session and in public, uh, where members of Congress grilled expert witnesses from outside the government, as well as government officials, where they often met privately with government officials to get the real story of what was going on. And that whole process has broken down and it's well documented by me. And uh, it's, it's a very non-visible sign of dysfunction that um, has to be fixed if Congress is going to re reassert itself uh, as a co-equal branch of government. So in the end, because of all these norms and structures and processes have deteriorated, and the, and the guardrails that kept them in place, what you see in Congress is not sober reflection about democracy and how to operate our democracy, but instead public focus on the people who are not particularly interested in democracy or only interested in furthering their own agendas and their own political careers. And, um, and those people, they existed in the 1960s, but they weren't allowed in Congress. They never got themselves elected. So let's look at some of the causes of electoral accountability. The most important probably is um, the perennial one that Congress has faced since 19, uh, 1787 when the first Congress convened. And that's the tension between the fact that members are individually accountable to their constituencies, they're not collectively accountable for 
their, the performance of the institution as a whole. And the way they run for office is always to say, this is what I did, this is what I'm trying to do. Here, I'm the good guy. And it's all the other members who are frustrating my efforts to represent you. Members of both parties do this. And in the past, there were, there were institutions like committees and less uh, and more inclusive parties than is the case now. And so they get away with it. There's nothing to counteract that kind of individualism in the Congress. More importantly, the election rules. Primaries to nominate candidates. When I first started studying Congress in the 1970s, most, most congressional candidates were chosen by county party leaders and state conventions and caucuses. Pri primaries became dominant beginning in the 1980s. And since then, um, they have been the way in which candidates were chosen. In a state like New Hampshire, choosing candidates by primaries is not as dangerous as it is in most states because voting in primaries is pretty high here. But in a state like South Carolina, for example, the nominees would be chosen in an election where fewer than 12% of the voters show up. Well, who do you think shows up when um, a primary happens? The extremists, the ideologues, the people who care deeply about politics, but who also are uh, disdainful of compromise. It's their way or the highway. And increasingly, our elections are really reminiscent of what happened in the Jim Crow South, except this occurs all over the country. And that is the major check on an incumbent is in the primary electorate. And the primary electorate is not interested in governance. It's interested in being right and, and forcing its agenda on other people. If I were a benevolent dictator and could pick one thing that I would change to improve the performance of this democracy, it would be to get rid of primaries. So someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who now can't represent her constituents on committees, and who's been repeatedly rebuked by even her own party is not going to face any serious electoral competition um, despite her inability to perform her duties. And that is happening all over the country. It happens in democratic seats and it happens in Republican seats. And, uh, and so when the institution doesn't perform properly, people who mobilized back in 1974 to throw the incumbent party out, they, they don't show up they don't, because they can't vote in, their, in the opposition party's primary necessarily. They don't trust the other party. And so somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene is free to do what she wants, which is to cause trouble. Uh, there's, no, there's no accountability there anymore in the system. And that to me is a hugely um, difficult problem to resolve because ironically primaries were instituted in order to create more democratic opportunities to voters to have a say in choosing their officials and the absolute opposite has been the result. In addition, we have a practice in the US uh, called uh, which rewards plurality winners, which is to say, if there's a third party or fourth party candidate in the race, people can win with less than a majority. Most democracies don't allow that uh, and um, or they have proportional representation in situations where there isn't a clear majority. You have lots of barriers to voting in this country. Uh, and despite them, we had record turnout for uh, the presidential election in 2020 because of acute mobilization efforts by both Republicans and Democrats. But in the coming off year elections in 2022, where control of the House and Senate is very much up for grabs, uh, the turnout will probably resort to the low 30s, which is where it's been for 100 years now. You have residential patterns that it happen in, this, in, the, in the country now where people sort by income, by race and by party. And this means that people can live their whole lives with 
today without ever having to bump into somebody who thinks differently from themselves. And this gets reflected in the makeup of Congress as well. You have gerrymandering. Uh, there are some controls uh, uh, over gerrymandering, not in the federal government, but in state constitutions, which were exercised in North Carolina and Pennsylvania just recently and upheld by the Supreme Court. You have large numbers of safe seats with little competition um, against incumbents, and that will probably be worse. With the latest redistricting, it looks like no more than 30 to 35 seats will be contested. Uh, out of 435 for the House. And, um, but that's also true in the Senate where there is no gerrymandering. So it isn't just gerrymandering, but what the parties have done in this cycle of redistricting is that they've made their incumbents safer. So that makes the system, the election system even more resistant to fundamental change when the public wants change. We've read a lot about polarization but if you look at this graph on the left-hand side, it goes all the way back to 1880. And uh, we had very high levels of polarization. That was a post-reconstruction era. And, um, and it lasted well into the um, Roosevelt, first Roosevelt administration. It declined after that because we had a lot of um, conservative uh, House Democrats coming from southern states and we had a lot of urban Republicans coming from suburban and uh, metropolitan areas in the north. And so um, you have the period of the depression and into the 1970s as a period where you had lots of conservative Democrats in the House and Senate and you had a good number of liberal Republicans in the House and Senate. The last liberal Republican in the Senate was Vermont's uh, Jim Jeffords, uh, who left in the early 2000s after um, switching parties from Republican to Democrat. And what you have now is there are almost no lawmakers who are available to the other party for uh, coalition building. There are a few, Susan Collins is a prominent one, but it's not, there aren't enough of them to overcome a filibuster. What you see in particular is the red line, which is the house is extraordinarily polarized. It's almost up to 0.9 on an index that goes from zero to one. So it means that there's no role, almost no roll call voting where you have um, people of the opposite party joining in coalition with the majority. The same is true in the Senate, although not quite as bad. This graph ends in 2016. Uh, it will be worse, potentially worse in the Senate um, after 2022. In the end, you also have social isolation with the parties. Uh, when uh, I was first here, I think in 96 after the election, I was invited to be a political monitor and uh, facilitator for the biennial conference that brought House members of both parties to Williamsburg, where they spent a long weekend getting to know each other as first year members, hearing lectures from various government officials and getting acquainted with each other. They went down on the train, they brought their spouses, uh, they socialized, and that actually was the last one, which had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with Newt Gingrich, who didn't like the idea that members of his party were going to be fraternizing with the enemy and potentially uh, seeing that they had valid points of view. So those kinds of uh, efforts uh, to build um, community within the Congress have, have gone away. And now you have a lot of members priding themselves on the fact that they don't have their families in Washington, that they sleep on the couch in their office. And so they leave on Thursday night and they don't come back till Tuesday morning. They're not seeing their, <laughs> their, their opponents um, in uh, at their kids' soccer games or the, any of the other things that used to happen. They don't play cards with each other anymore, which was poker games were a famous way of building legislative coalitions. So um, there also has been a, a sort of glorification of amateurism and outsider status. 
instead of policy expertise or coalition building expertise, people who can get things done, you have people saying, I'm not tainted by politics. When of course, once they get in office, they have to be politicians. And the problem is they don't know how to do it. And you're seeing that with Youngkin right now in Virginia, a, a, a successful businessman who put together a very impressive coalition in Virginia, a state that was trending blue and is now discovering that he doesn't know how to govern and he's already in trouble and he's only been in office for a couple of months. And that we see that a lot with businessmen who are elected to the Senate or to the House. They're used to having people defer to them. They're used to being the, you know, in a top of a hierarchical pyramid and suddenly they have to operate with consensus in, a, in an institution that's really troubled now in terms of consensus. So what all that means is the consequences of all of this dysfunction and it's many, you can see there are many, many causes is um, very consequential. And the reason why it matters that Congress can't do its job and individual members have no incentive to do their job is that the framers designed the constitution to be the most powerful branch. Uh, they did, they uh, felt that um, as the representative body, it was be the most important. It's why they made Congress Article One in the Constitution, why there are ordinances in Washington where you can't build a building higher than the Capitol Dome, and where all the serious powers of the poor purse to declare war uh, and so forth are lodged there. So when the institution works poorly, the results are shutdowns, gridlock, institutional conflict, and a sense of crisis almost continuously. And there are two things that flow from that. One is that the executive branch knows it can get away with stuff. And indeed, members are so aware of their own impotence that they will often implore the president to do things. Congress, for example, was tried and failed multiple times to enact immigration reform. So Democrats urged President Obama to have the dream, dreamers through executive order and Republicans uh, prevailed upon Donald Trump, who didn't need a lot of urging, uh, to engage in, uh, to use his executive authority to slow the tide of, of um, uh, immigration at the borders. Um, officials refused to testify at hearings or to honor subpoenas or to provide documents that are required in statute, annual reports, for example, about uh, various things that Congress has, has required in the past. You have officials failing to get authorization on major foreign policy uh, outcomes or even informing Congress that these things are happening again in violation of statute. You have violation of budget appropriations decisions. Trump, for example, raided the defense budget in order to build more of his wall. Uh, and these things happened under previous presidents, but they reached a level of intensity and frequency uh, in the Trump years that was really quite astonishing. You also get the Supreme Court being aggressive when um, uh, uh, Congress is impotent. They're supposed to be bound by stare decisis, uh, let this precedent stand, and this court is busily and happily overturning many of uh, longstanding precedents um, because they know Congress can't do anything about it. And, um, and that will continue to happen. So increasingly what we're left with is a government that um, is perceived as being very unresponsive to the majority in this country. And that's not an incorrect proposition. If you look at this first graph, it lists countries in order. The U.S. is number is fourth on the list. The dark green to the left is the public that says um, the political system needs to be completely reformed. The light green says it needs major changes. If you add for the U.S., 85 percent of the public thinks the government either needs complete reformation or major changes. 12% say minor changes and only 2% no changes are needed. So you have bipartisan agreement when you get majorities that large of sense among the public that 
um, things are very seriously out of whack. Um, you also have um, a decline in, de in attitudes. These are, um, and they're, as it turns out, they're closely related to ethnic antagonism in the cultural um, wars. So um, on the horizontal axis, you have a, an index of um, people who um, are antagonistic to ethnic um, groups. And there are a whole bunch of questions, survey questions that were used to construct this index. So, um, and there are different questions. So the red one is, it's hard to trust elections. So people who have low levels of racial antagonism or ethnic antagonism are um, quite likely to say they trust elections, 30%. People who score high on this are nearly 100% in saying that you can't trust elections. Um, the next one, using force to save your way of life. Again, this is highly connected to whether you um, are antagonistic to other ethnic groups. Um, and, um, and the same is true that strong leaders should bend the rules and also citizens should take the law into their own hands. This is really quite a remarkable graph and it was put together by a political scientist who is highly esteemed in the discipline. So this was carefully done and it is really striking how much the culture wars and antagonism towards various ethnic groups is driving so much of the dysfunction in our politics. The US democracy is viewed less favorably by 56% of people around the world. Uh, it, trust in government is at historic lows and it's also highly partisan. So Republicans trust government more when they have a Republican president, Democrats do the same thing. The legitimacy of election outcomes. Two thirds of Republicans still deny that Biden was a legitimate winner of the ele election. Support for the January 6th assault on the Capitol is still backed by 25% of Republicans. Belief of 15% of Republicans that violence is necessary to change course. Um, and of these people, 28% are um, or 28% of Republicans believe violence is necessary, 13% independents and 7% of Democrats think this way. There's a fundamental disagreement about voting. Democrats say it's a right, Republicans say it's a privilege and they, their policies are a quarter. So um, what this all adds up to is a very troubling um, minority, but it's a fairly substantial minority, which is driving our politics. And if you go back and make the link to who votes in primaries, you can begin to see where the problem is. Uh, another cartoon that suggests that um, the threat to our institutions is coming from inside. And I think that's right. Um, <coughs> basically, electoral politics have been skewed so much by uh, warped participation and dark money um, that members are not really able to see the importance of reforming their own institution. And again, this is a problem because the Constitution um, depends on um, ambition, counting or act ambition. Madison wrote that each member of its own branch would be loyal to its branch and therefore they would defend it their branch from the encroachments of the others. And that's the big difference between what happened after January 6th and, what's hap uh, and what happened back in the 1970s after the near invasion of uh, the Capitol uh, over the Vietnam War. At that, back then, members understood that if they didn't get their house in order, they were gonna be consigned to permanent irrelevance. Today, the members don't seem to care that much, or at least a large number of them, particularly in the Republican Party. Uh, they, after all, um, managed to uh, support what the rioters asked for, or many of them did, more than half Republicans, uh, even though um, they were the, the victims themselves of violence. And that's just astonishing to me, and I still don't fully understand it. Um, but it seems as if party loyalty is more important to members who understand they are now the weakest branch and seem to accept it. Um, 
And more importantly, um, it seems that individuals in both the House and Senate who could lead the way, um, they don't, they can't muster the majorities to do it. And here the filibuster in the Senate is um, a major barrier to reform because it's so abused so um, in, uh, fully. If I were also a, be a benevolent dictator inside the chamber, I would make it harder to, for filibustering. I would go back to requiring that senators actually have to be present and hold the floor uh, personally uh, if they wanna conduct a filibuster. And that would make a huge difference because it would shift the cost of the filibuster from the chamber and the majority to the individuals who want to block things. Most importantly, um, I thought there would be, you know, that after what happened, that the country would be so disgusted, and it clearly is, given some of the opinion polls I've shown you, that members would come to Washington determined to reform the institution. There is a laudable, in my view, some of you may disagree, effort to get to the bottom of what actually drove the insurrection and the assault on the Capitol, but you don't see members looking seriously at their institution and the way in which they themselves have created conditions that invited that kind of assault. And I don't see the election of 2022 bringing in a wave of reformers that would drive that process. And finally, um, I think it's, um, it's quite troubling that um, the past, the patterns that people like me relied on to try to understand this institution, the past just doesn't seem to be a predictor of what we can expect from this institution going forward. And that perhaps is the most troubling at all, that we're in a period of volatility and we just don't know what to expect. And it's very uncertain and worrisome times. I wish I could end on a brighter note, but that's really where my reflections have led me. So now I think Martha is going to take your questions and I look forward to having a conversation with you. Linda, I have a few questions about campaign contributions and, and the effect of money in politics. Um, one is what about the role of money in politics as a source of congressional dysfunction? And this is probably more important than the primary system. And one of the questions mentions also uh, dark money. Yes, those are all connected. Uh, and in fact, primaries wouldn't be so uh, important if it weren't for dark money. That basically what dark money does or, um, camp or public money too of large contributions basically means that members can be independent of their party and they can attract extremist voters. Now, please notice who the sources of this money often are. On the right, they tend to be conservative ideologues like Mercer uh, or Edelman, who's now passed away, or a bunch of very wealthy people who've been driving a conservative uh, reaction uh, to trends in the federal government, which are have a lot of support from majority of voters, but which they don't like. You find the same thing on the left. It used to be labor unions who drove a lot of the, the campaign finance um, for Democrats, but unions are so weak now that they're not as big a, as big a factor. But there also are very intense interest groups uh, on, the, on the left that fuel these candidates. So I see primaries and, and money as going hand in hand. The, Candidates can afford to uh, cater to extremist groups because they can raise their own money. They, they have their sort of personal, their, their personal brands and their personal little businesses of raising money. And it also means that they are afraid to work with the other side because their money will be cut off. And it, getting cut off in a primary election is really tough because you can be a good representative and lose your backing and, um, and then some extremists will come in who's more attractive to the left wing or the right wing donors and they'll take you out. So the two are not separate. They're intimately connected with the polarized politics and the dysfunction that we have now. <laughs> 
Okay, we have one question here. When the majority of Americans agree on something, why is it that Congress ignores it? Gun safety, for instance, it can't be just money as the NRA doesn't have that much to give compared to other organizations. <laughs> Well, actually, until last year, the NRA was a major funder, um, and uh, and its endorsements were also very powerful, and they had a great deal of weight uh, in rural uh, red states. And so uh, Republicans basically found it absolutely impossible to go against the NRA. Uh, the NRA is a classic example of interest group overreach where the president of the organization forgot that he represented people and used it for his own little, seems to have used it for his own uh, financial gain. So the an NRA was not a factor in, in this last election, but it has been a major driver of Republican donations. And it's one reason why uh, gun control legislation, even if it can't get out of committee, and it would be stopped by a filibuster. The Democrats in the House have passed legislation multiple times, but it dies in the Senate. And that's where um, the NRA has been particularly effective. Would term limits help? No. <laughs> <laughs> I testified in, nine, in 1995. Uh, before Congress, before the, uh, the Judiciary Committee, they were considering a term limits bill. It appears that term limits are unconstitutional for starters, but it's also the case that we have term limits in a lot of state legislatures, and that is definitely not made state legislatures more responsive to public opinion. If anything, what's happened is that members who are subject to term limits in state legislatures are focused on their next office. And so they're worried about offending the interest groups that they need to move up the ladder. And so they haven't been courageous citizen legislatures. What does happen when you have high turnover in legislatures, and that's true of the Congress right now, is you have a lot of amateurs and they tend to behave in ways that are not necessarily constructive. They don't know anything. They don't know how to pass a bill. They don't have any memory of why past approaches might have failed. And, um, and I quoted Mr. Madison to the, the lawmakers on Congress that basically when what Congress, what Madison said was that we need masters of the public business in Congress, people who know how to get things done. You also had um, Jefferson saying that whenever you have uh, uh, large numbers of newcomers, they're more susceptible to dem demagogues. And that is the, the fundamental weakness in my view uh, um, of term limits that you would, you would, have people even more susceptible to interest group pressure. And that's exactly what happens in the legislatures at the state level that embraced term limits. The bills are basically written on the right by Alex, which is a right wing uh, advocacy group. And, um, and it's mostly Republican states that have embraced those. That isn't to say that I'm in favor of keeping incumbents in place forever. Um, but there are some incumbents who do a very good job, and uh, I'd hate to lose their expertise and their, um, their knowledge of the process. So the real problem is not that we need term limits, but that we need to uh, make, reform our elections so that a small group of uh, extreme partisans in both parties are not controlling who runs and who wins. Do you have any suggestions for people of actions to take to hold election, elected representatives accountable? Well, yeah, it used to be writing letters. It was a good way to do it. And I've studied letter writers back in the 80s. Right now, um, it's impossible really to uh, get meaningful letter writing campaigns. I think the most important thing is really for citizens to try to educate their fellow citizens about why um, simple solutions are not really going to fix this. Violence isn't going to, 
and neither are uh, catch-all catchy phrases like term limits, that we basically have a lot of serious work to do uh, about educating people about their own government. And uh, right now, people are so ignorant about how the system actually works that they are easy prey for all kinds of simplistic uh, notions about how things work. I would say the other thing, where the guardrails were exercised in our country in the past were among political elites who basically shared certain kinds of values about tolerance and who sort of kept a lid on things. And what's really happened is that elites have polarized and they are driving a lot of the division. And I, it's hard when their money is so important in elections, it's hard to see how they can be made to be more responsive to the majorities in the center. We're still a centrist country. We're slightly right of center. We're not a progressive country and we almost never are except during place, times like the New Deal uh, or the civil rights movement. And, um, but the people in the center are kind of like that old joke that that's where you find the roadkill in the middle of the road. And that's, I think the way many centrists feel. And so some of them are being attracted to these rather strange and extreme ideologies and conspiracy theories. How does the rise and fall of pork barrels affect those in Congress? Well, if you re may recall, a pork barrel legislation was uh, banned in Congress that members were not allowed to uh, put in private uh, requests for appropriations for their own districts. And after 20 years of that experiment, this is the first year where the federal budget is now allowing members to engage in pork. And it actually has been a less acrimonious process than in the past, no, but because now members have skin in the game in a way that they felt they didn't. And they like to be able to claim credit for uh, a new hospital or a new bridge or things that are tangible reminders of what the federal government can do. So when, when Newt Gingrich tried to abolish pork, a lot of political scientists said, be careful what you wish for. What that's gonna do is remove one of the most important tools for building consensus in the country. Uh, and, um, and that's exactly what happened. It's not the only reason and bringing pork back is not gonna have major, but it does affect things at the margin. Okay, this is a rather complicated question, but it raises the question of independence. So when you cite a percentage of Republicans who believe X, are you referring to anyone who tends to vote Republican or only people who are registered Republicans? If we include independence in the seats, could that change our impression of how many Americans overall think X? Is this important to keep in mind? as we try to it's assess degrees really, of actual yes, polarization. That's a, that's a very sophisticated question because those results are not often presented. And in that particular poll, I asked that question myself, how were independent treated? In most public opinion polls, when you're looking at approval numbers or those sorts of things, uh, basically people are asked a, a follow-up question. Uh, if you're an independent, you tend to lean towards one party or the other. And the people who say they lean Democratic or lean Republican are counted as Republicans. And there's a lot of empirical evidence that most people are leaners, that only about 10% of the public is actually independent. But in some of the studies that I cited, I wasn't able to tell. Uh, and, um, and that matters because the biggest group of voters in this country identifies as independent, <laughs> <laughs> particularly in New Hampshire. And, um, but, uh, in some, but in many states, independents are not allowed to participate in, in primaries. So it really is hard to know whether, my guess is that it tends to be people who are diehard Republicans who are in those numbers. And, um, and some independents have, uh, who, who have behaved like Republicans, 
change their behavior in the 2020 election, at least at the presidential level. So it's not a hard and fast rule and political scientists are always sort of making judgment calls about how to count them or not. I have a colleague at Dartmouth who says that these polls emphasizing violence and how, what a large percentage seem to be interested in violence, that they, many of those polls are themselves flawed that the question wording could be better in some of them and in others. Um, it's a pretty big step to go from somebody saying, yeah, I'll pick up my gun and I'll go and to actually doing it. And so, uh, and we know from lots of things like voting behavior, about 10% of the public lies about whether they actually voted or not. And so <laughs> you, you can't unfur uh, that 30% of the public is going to is going to take up arms uh, against the US government. But it is troubling that that number, which has always been very low in the US, has crept up to 30%. That people are at least think it's okay to say that they're going to be violent. And that's a big difference. Okay, we have some questions about the Senate. Um, I'll read one that's typical. How to reform the Senate, how to reform the Senate when senators not elected by one person, one vote, and less populated rural states are overrepresented in the Senate. Senators representing a small minority of the population can block legislation and executive branch appointments. How would you suggest to fix this? Well, I gave another talk um, to the Vermont Osher group uh, a couple of months ago about the Senate and how it's become increasingly uh, an obstacle to majority rule in this country. Uh, I think a voter in Wyoming now has 457 times as much political influence as a voter in California, the, most, the least populous state and the most populous state. And there's always been an imbalance between the the rural states and the and the more urban developed states, but it has become really extreme at this point. And it's overlapped at a time where abuse of the filibuster has also become extreme. So you put the two together and reform is uh, very problematic. Now the constitution says that each chamber is the judge of its own rules. And so the impetus for reform has to come from within. And here, there is a group of senators, most of whom sadly either retired in the last election cycle or are retiring now, who would be um, the swing group to actually engage in serious reform uh, of the Senate in terms of the filibuster and some other kinds of procedural changes. Uh, but they're not numerous enough, and it turns out that they're not as courageous as one might wish in uh, going against their own party. Sometimes what happens in the United States is that um, groups, extreme groups overreach. The anti-communists of the McCarthy era come to mind where they were riding high, the public was behind them, they were tormenting people in Hollywood, they were um, engaged in cleaning out the State Department and they made the mistake of going after the US Army. In that famous hearing where an attorney uh, named Welch basically said on national TV, have you no shame, Ms. Senator McCarthy, have you no shame? And of course the overreach was that McCarthy went after the army in 1953, which was after the great war and the good war. And so many people had sacrificed in that war. And uh, for McCarthy to think he could get away with uh, his claims that there were millions of people in the army who were communist sympathizers just wasn't credible and it violated the sense of decency of the American public. And McCarthy, he did succeed in winning re-election and by 19, the late 1950s, he was completely irrelevant. So sometimes you think, okay, these groups will overreach. And that's what I thought happened in January 6th, but it was an overreach, but it turns out that the public still, at least in one party, was not willing to 
to see it that way. Uh, a lot of people, I think, would honestly felt they were going to defend democracy when they went that day. And that's, that's what um, hasn't changed yet and why we're still litigating this election in um, 2022. I think some of these reforms are going to, or so-called reforms about elections are going to be perceived as ineffective or worse. Let's not forget that the Jim Crow reforms that suppressed black voters also suppressed white voters in the South. And the same thing seems to have happened in Texas where so many mail-in ballots were, were disallowed and uh, a, big, uh, a big part of the group of people who were who were disenfranchised were elderly white people who are one of the backbones of the Republican coalition. But it's not much of a strategy to sort of say, well, we'll muddle along with the status quo until uh, people who want to destroy the system overreach and, and uh, cause their own demise. Uh, that I don't think that's going to work. I have a question here, um, and I'm looking at the time. Yeah. Uh, that I think maybe this will be the last question. Mm -hmm. Please discuss the effect the media has on this whole problem of dysfunction in Congress, especially the dissemination of false information. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> it's a good thing that's the last one. I'll be exhausted from answering it. But it is <laughs> a big part of the dysfunction of Congress. I have a whole chapter on this in my 2015 book on the decline of oversight is that the media don't cover Congress as an institution anymore. There are very few people who have Capitol Hill as their beat. There are very few state uh, news media outlets who cover their own state legislatures. So these lawmakers um, are driven by personal ambition to attract attention of the media. And what does the media value most of all? Conflict and news. So they don't consider it news. Oh, Senator so-and-so worked very hard to pass a bill that reformed the uh, human trafficking law. That's success. It passed so there was no conflict. Instead, what they will do is cover Senator so-and-so who rode around with the truck convoy circling Washington DC last week, our own Ted, you know, Ted Cruz from Texas. So uh, part of what uh, many, many people have written about media values and what the media finds important as news, it's the man bites dog story, not, um, not the reverse that we all know to be true. So when Congress does its job, it doesn't get covered. And it's the conflict and the, and the when there's corruption, most members of Congress are very honest. And, but, but the member who isn't is the one who attracts the attention. And over time, this has really skewed uh, incentives for individual behavior. Uh, and the fact that when Trump was president, they were covering his tweets which certainly weren't policies, more than they were covering what was happening in Congress or not happening in Congress, uh, I think is a disgrace. Um, it's hard, however, to blame the press because the, the ownership of newspapers has been corporatized. The emphasis is on infotainment rather than hard news that newsrooms all around the country on TV and in newspapers are embattled or defunct. And, um, and you, uh, so one remedy there is we're starting to see Vermont Digger, for example, that foundations are starting to support inter independent news organizations. And that may introduce some corrective to the system. But now it's really the lawmakers are, uh, they're under attack by extremists, they're being attacked on email and they're being attacked in social media and there doesn't seem to be any penalty for news organizations to publish this stuff. And we certainly don't want to suppress them and tell them what to write because then that's another whole set of problems. And it, it's a 
it's a problem that's been brewing for a long, long time and, is, and political scientists have been warning about it for a long, long time. And now we're really, social media has really brought it to the fore. Well, I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all the questions because frankly, we could probably keep you here the rest of the day if I asked them all. <laughs> but <laughs> I wanna thank you very much for this very uh, clarifying and, and broad talk. And now I'm going to turn it back to Pam. Linda, thank you so much on behalf of Osher for your time and your expertise. And, and you're smiling and Martha's smiling and I'm smiling, but frankly, <laughs> I don't know why we're smiling at this point. <laughs> oh my. And I'm looking at the stats, over 10% of the Osher membership has attended this session this morning. So that is, uh, that's outstanding. So much appreciated. Please stay tuned for the next two special events in the next couple of months and our summer lecture series, which is addressing challenges to our democracy. Again, Linda, thank you so much. <laughs>